Hey guys, it's Matt. About one and a half minutes before reading chapter 27, there's some people that through comments, some emails to me, have suggested that they're going to share certain chapters of the book with, say, people around them. I think this is a very bad idea. This book is for us. It would be pure gibberish to anybody, even in our own truth community, who's not, say, higher than fifth, sixth, or seventh grade level. Pure gibberish. It's for us and us alone. If this was shared with somebody, say, not in, quote, our community, it would literally be like a Tower of Babel reenactment. The moment <laughs> the t- everybody was cursed and couldn't communicate with each other. If you, if you want a Tower of Babel reenactment, start sharing these chapters, but I don't suggest that. Final note, there are several topics in this chapter that you've heard before, even recently, like the stuffed Lenin, the Humpty Dumpty. I remind you, this book has to stand alone for those transitioning from first grade to fifth grade truth, from chasing the yellow breadcrumbs into something more meaningful. It has to stand alone for 20 or 30 years. These people are not going to have the history they had with us on YouTube. So I, I ask that you just put up with the stuff that you know. Again, the book has to stand alone, and let's say I hit on some of these topics and I'm correct about a few things. If I'm correct and reality does need to operate in this fashion, these are pretty important concepts. Maybe it might be okay to hear it again, and I'll try to make it as interesting as I can, of course. One thing I forgot, these chapters are written out for me to present them in this way on YouTube and to see your comments, emails, etc., and refine them. I know this is getting way too long for a book. I promise something short and concise. When it ever reaches its book stage, I understand like 30, 40% of this needs to be cut out. Sections where I talk about similar things, all of that needs to be consolidated. What we're doing here is a complete dump of every single concept. Not for bathroom boys, because a lot of these chapters go well over an hour. Not for bathroom boys at all. But finally, again, the book is going to, there's so much that needs to be chopped out of here for a book. I just want to let you know that is the intention. Chapter 27. Most of you have heard me say, probably a few thousand times by now, the reality gives itself away. When stated like this, it usually means that the dark part that the creeps have masterminded is revealed to us as being very artificial. In general, we know that this universe could not possibly be a natural phenomenon that came from an explosion in space. For many reasons, they desperately want us to believe in that, and they get something out of real people accepting that absurd notion is true. Seeing how ridiculous the modern age has become is the best news of all time to real people. The dark reality of what I call the not milk has exposed itself in a big way in this century, seemingly because it has to. Its performance was much more believable in the last century. Its aims and goals are now very much out in the open. In a way, its endless systems and governments behave like tentacles supporting one thing. No, the earth system can no longer be seen as a natural world. But the good news for us keeps coming. The more that part of this reality is revealed as being intentionally sinister, the more powerful of an entity we must be, because we're the final arbiter of whether its trick has been successful or not. It has no say on its own success. Only we do. Again, let's talk briefly about the Goldilocks principle. Remember the key line from the fairy tale was, not too hot, not too cold, but just right. Not too big, not too small, just right, whatever it may be. Again, the Goldilocks principle, from our perspective, means that what is observed in our world is unnaturally right down the middle. The chances of this happening over and over again are astronomically small. Because of how many random variables there are in existence, If something is presenting itself as right down the middle over and over again, then one would think this should be a very rare occurrence. In a real world, that should be as rare as a poisonous sauce on a Big Mac. But that's what you get without asking it. Well, I can't say the name of the restaurant. You never know. (laughs) Way too many things here are Goldilocks for this reality to be real. For example, the Earth's location to the sun, and how many hours there are in a day. As usual, perfect Goldilocks. Matt, you don't believe in the cosmology of Carl's... No, I don't believe in the cosmology of Carl Sagan. I can't do a damn sidebar every time. Let's continue. There are so many presentations like this in reality that it quickly shows us how fake it all is. In almost everything that comes on the news, we see things one way, and our best friend, say, sees things another way. 
There's always the proper mix of evidence that falls on both sides to balance the scales between us in order to keep each camp dug into their own position. Because this reality presents so many things that can be interpreted as, quote, right down the middle or Goldilocks, each side of an argument can see what it wants to see and collect up enough fabricated evidence to support their own desired interpretation. This means that nobody ever comes over to the other side. The final outcome, in almost all cases, is there is no winner. No real world could keep doing this over and over. No winner in endless camps is the not milk's desired goal. For example, how many presentations on the news are obviously cake and a lake to us, but contain just enough professionalism with tiny bits of what your friends would call credible evidence so we can never get our friends and family to see what we see. They never take our side, and we never understand their side. The more we yell fake, the more they seem to dig in, believing it's all real. How so many events deliver conflicting evidence to both sides at the same time is the Goldilocks principle of a fake reality. It always straddles the middle between us and our friends and family. We cry out, uh, if a certain event at a mall or in a school or in space or was just a little bit more absurd, I could then show my friend Tony and he would finally see what I see regarding this cake in a lake school event. But it never happens. Never getting a win decade after decade of trying is another sign of a fake world. The first grade researchers believe the secret societies are pulling it all off. Goldilocks is all around us all the time in this reality. From how the presidential election is so close every four years that extra days and time needs to be taken so that it can be correctly called, I guess started with hanging chads, <laughs> that all the way up to exactly how far the earth is from the sun and everything in between is Goldilocks. Wow, aren't we lucky that our Paramecium ancestors spawned on this earth? Mars is too far. The Paramecium ancestors would have frozen their asses off. Venus is too close to be inhabitable. Without Goldilocks, those Paramecium relatives of yours would have been burned the fuck up. They have somehow devolved what they call the human being into version negative 10.0 which means it's gone backwards. The Homo sapiens sapien of the genus Double Dumb is in a state where almost anything presented on the news is believed, no matter how absurd. I think that the endless attempts from us to show our friends and family what we see is an intentional part of the reality distraction and something to overcome in life, doing part two, the work. It's like a game that our side has been tricked into playing over and over again. We are here to carry our cross and bear the weight of the realization that we and only we can see these things and that others cannot and will never see them. If we can't get over this frustration, we certainly are not ready to graduate out of this reality. There are a ton of Goldilocks principles associated with the Earth's cosmology. This does not mean, again, that Captain Kirk can actually fly around out there. It's Goldilocks in its presentation, no matter what is actually happening in what you believe to be or call space. If the Earth's rotation was slower, so we received, say, 40 hours of sun a day and 40 hours of dark at night, then about 80% of the Earth would be uninhabitable because it would be too hot or too cold. It would be like a July day in Baghdad for us all the time. What an amazing coincidence that our sunlight is the perfect 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night, at least at the equinox, so even places in the Middle East have a chance to cool off, and Lawrence can make it across the desert to Damascus. Of course, the scientists tell us about the fortunate coincidence that the Earth just happened to be comprised of such a high amount of oxygen, while all the other planets are noxious gases that will burn a hole in your damn throat. We are told we can only see one side of the moon because it rotates at the perfect speed to match our perspective every time we look up at it from Earth. I think the bullshit name they give that absurd phenomenon is tidal lock. Oh, sure, tidal lock. It's yet another one in a billion coincidence. I'm getting kind of sick of those, aren't you? Even Mandela effects are typically right down the middle and incredibly subtle, playing reality's game over and over. 
We'll never wake up in the morning to find out that Mr. T has always been called Mr. PP, which would mean we could be 100% sure it changed, right? It's always subtle. So interpretations, again, fall on both sides. The top of Mr. T's van in the show The A-Team is now gray above the red stripe and not all jet black as many remember. So we say to ourselves, maybe I just didn't see it clearly on my father's 19-inch piece of shit television. Maybe our cheap-ass Zenith couldn't distinguish dark gray from black and I never noticed it. Yet many people call it a Mandela effect and they're sure that the van in the past, there's no other way to say it, was all black. It seems like it must be something we just saw wrong on an old TV, right? But there's so many residual pieces of evidence floating around to support those who swear it's a Mandela effect. For example, there are A-Team model vans being sold as official merchandise that are all black, not gray at all. The purpose here is not to aggravate or alienate the Mandela-affected people in this community, but to point out that the Goldilocks aspect of reality pops up absolutely everywhere. One of the main things to notice here is the endless Goldilocks presentations keep producing one in a million or even one in a billion coincidences, and no real world could keep doing that. How fortunate for us that water evaporates from the oceans without taking the salt up into the air with it. If that happened, we'd all be dead. There are thousands of things like this most people have never thought about. For example, most of you have experienced very large hail. It's very rare. We've all seen it at one time or another in our lives. A rare type of cumulonimbus cloud carries water up so high into the atmosphere that the water combines to form ice and then chunks of ice and balls of ice as it starts to fall. Yet a blizzard of wet snow, say at temperatures just above freezing, it can snow at 40 degrees Fahrenheit and under. It does not have to be below 32. A blizzard of wet snow does not produce massive clumps of snow falling through the air. Well, why not? Think about it. A snowstorm at, say, 35 degrees allows somebody to pack a good snowball in two seconds. It all sticks together instantly. Yet, with billions and billions of sticky flakes flying around in the wind, the flakes don't combine in midair like hail. Wouldn't falling water somehow combining to produce giant pieces of ice be harder to do in nature than sticky snow uh, clumping together on the way down? So I'm saying so big pieces would be falling. Hail, the combination of hail seems thousands of times harder than for sticky snow to combine. Even in the snowstorm, the pieces never stick together. But when they land on top of each other, you can reach your hand out and just squeeze your fingers together and it all immediately packs together. Now you go figure that one out. Where are you going with this, Matt? It's another example of a fake world. It's a reality breakdown to me. What Gus is saying is if nature can produce golf ball or grapefruit size hail in some rare cases, a wet snowstorm should have snowballs potentially the size of Frosty the Snowman coming down on us from time to time during the year, many of which would smash right through your damn roof. Perhaps 20 U.S. states would be unlivable. Think about it. This isn't a stretch. The combining of water into ice that can increase its mass a thousandfold should be magnitudes harder than wet, sticky snowflakes combining on the way down, especially in high winds. Yet, they don't combine. In snow, somehow the water combines initially to make the perfect flake, each one unique to the other. Now, that initial combination to make the snowflake, again, every one is said to be different. That to be is a much harder process than once the snowing begins in high winds, the flakes sticking together on the way down. I understand if you live in Montana and it's five degrees outside, the flakes are not going to stick together. It's not a wet snow at all. The flakes could bounce off each other and there'd be no stickiness. But especially here in what you would call the coastal states, Pennsylvania is close enough to the Atlantic Ocean, New Jersey, cities uh, from, say, Raleigh all the way up through Boston, we get a wet snow all the time. Not just because of the temperatures of when it's snowing, you can have a sleet or a rain mixed in with the snow. 
all those wet conditions, well, nature forms hail in some situations. If it were to smash together in the winds, you would think it would create gigantic clumps. It somehow never happens. Maybe somebody's yelling at me and trying to explain it. So, well, Matt, there's a certain, you know, magnetism in water. Water is very magnetic with the poles of positive and negative, and somehow the flakes repel. Well, e even if that's the case, well, then that's also perfect Goldilocks, isn't it? What a coincidence that that aspect of snow exists so it doesn't form clumps that would make 20 states potentially unlivable. Okay, this has gone on too long. There are thousands of these. No real world could keep doing this. That's my main point. Now, the creeps didn't engineer this place, but they have an ancient understanding, I believe, of how this reality works. If we're noticing these unnatural Goldilocks presentations, well, they've potentially noticed them for a thousand years or much longer. And they have certain reality buttons and levers to make this aspect work for themselves to get what they want. So what do the endless Goldilocks or right down the middle presentations do at least the ones manipulated by the creeps. This aspect of reality creates camps. Right down the middle creates camps, or is the ideal condition to create camps. Two camps ensure friction, polarity, and what a coincidence, it gets right back to energy harvesting, what the knot milk needs to survive. However, if we stop playing its game and we've backed up far enough to look down, it doesn't matter one bit if we are right and the sheeple or normies are wrong. We must see that there is no right and no wrong in a place like this. There is only camps and the avoidance of camps. If we've chosen a side and we dig in because we must be correct and we can see more than they can see, then we've done, in a sense, exactly what it wants and we have lost. The knot nook plays its never-ending game for energy. To get what it needs, it must disrupt your spiritual journey, and it must disrupt why you are here. You've heard this one before. It takes two to tango. There ain't no dance, at least one called the tango, with just one person parading around out there. We in this truth research community have been fooled, of course, to take its demonic dance floor and break dance over its corrugated cardboard. Being correct doesn't matter if you are bigger than this place. Pause if you have to. Do you believe you're bigger than this place? What does your inner knowing and tuning fork tell you? Well, it's pretty obvious. Of course we are. The screen doesn't care about winning or losing as long as real people who are bigger than this place come down to its level and play its game and take a side and walk out on its magenta playing field. Get off its dance floor and what, what about yourself? The only winning move with the knot milk or from its perspective is not to play. An entire book could be written on all the ways the asshole dark through its governments and systems gets up in our face all day long just to create the emotional energy that it feeds upon. People go along with it from A to Z, when if they stop to think about it, they'd say there's almost no legitimate reason for what they're being burdened with. In the last chapter, we discussed the DMV Driver Center and Real ID. When you go to reach into your pocket for a quarter, its tentacle has already been there, having left you with a penny. It's beyond unnatural, the amount of red tape and tiny burdens it places on people and on small business, for example. I don't care how dysfunctional governments are. Most of it, if the world was real, should have been fixed by now. What the heck is all this technology for then? Some would say it's actually to make your life worse, and they would have a good point. The amazing thing is the people who lay down all this distraction, the lower level minions, have no idea how they are serving the master trickster. It has millions of plays in its playbook in order to distract you from what you are supposed to do with your life. Another way reality gives itself away is through how hard its minions work to influence real people like you and me to build out its Dracula's castle. It cannot build Dracula's castle on its own. It needs the powerful beings here, real people, to do it. It knows that the real people have been fooled to believe they have no power and to look to it for rewards. Oh my God, how sick is this system and how evil genius is our adversary. 
These minions, on behalf of the Not Nilk, work 24-7, 365. They stay open like a satanic convenience store. They never take a year off. They never sit back and put their feet up and congratulate themselves. They're like the Terminator. This gives the nature of what they are away. All we need to know is they are not the same as we are. It is a different sort of entity or incarnation. It's here as a role player to block us. You've heard me say this a few thousand times, that it endlessly gets up in our business. That's not normal. It's not the same entity that you are. It can't be. It never leaves real people alone. Just when the trajectory of life looks a bit normal again, oh no, here comes C, the V, me, or whatever they're going to cook up and lay down on us, or turmoil like between Israel and its neighbors, and it can't leave real people alone. It gives itself away. Its big ticket distractions, like those just mentioned, are easy for us to notice, but let's not overlook all the little stuff it does to real people. We recently talked about the uselessness of real ID. Cars can no longer be built without a backup camera. It's just one more Chinese part to break, so you have to sit in your dealer's service center all day long. An ice maker in a new refrigerator can't seem to work for more than about two years without some bullshit plastic part breaking. It's placed on back order then, and because of the cooked up supply shortage that shouldn't exist, you must wait four months to get your damn ice. Fireplaces and wood-burning stoves are banned in most big cities, at least for new construction. The state of California has its own standards on what sort of products can be sold inside its penitentiary in order to make people's lives even more complicated and miserable. My gas-powered generator in my garage says, cannot be sold in the state of California. This applies to thousands of products. Your best friend, a likely defender of reality, cries, uh, Matt, their emission standards are more stringent because their politicians are green hippies. They always have a way to explain it away. It's never just not milk trying to keep us off a spiritual mission. Your best friend can never understand that. That explanation isn't possible to the people around us. It's not even on the table. Getting back to California, what does raising the bar a tiny bit on the emissions of a portable generator matter in a state that puts out hundreds of trillions of particulates into the atmosphere a month during certain parts of the year through wildfires? All the portable generators in the world could run continuously for a century, and it would not equal the emissions of, say, the Paradise Fire or something like that. Good job, California! Why don't you fly drones back and forth between San Diego and Malibu Beach that have a special sensor so they can detect if swimmers are peeing in the ocean? Couldn't that harm, say, a sea lion or something if they swam through the piss? There is no news article that ever could be presented that would surprise you and me and our community based on the insanity of what may come out of California. Headline, Los Angeles County to spend $150 million putting in beautiful bathrooms and restrooms and imploring surfers to use them before getting into the water. Kelp beds and seaweed forests, vital to the sea otter community, endangered and becoming distressed because of piss from surfers, as well as the drugs and marijuana leaching out into the water from their activities the night before. You see, people, the endless irony of this reality is also a giveaway to its true fake nature. California, oh, this portable generator is one more puff of smoke too high for it to make California's strict standards, and everybody celebrates it. Oh, they're so green and they care so much, yet the state produces the equivalent of like 50 million volcanoes worth of ash into the air from wildfires. The irony is off the charts. There's no point in limiting my generator that's sold in Pennsylvania cannot be sold in California when you have this sort of fire issue. Do you see how absurd the irony is? Back to the chapter listing out more not milk bullshit. Car registration is probably similar in other states as it is in Pennsylvania. When I'm stopped by a cop, the cop says, license and registration. Now, it would be funny if somebody could record on a secret camera, say, a question back to the officer. Uh, officer, what is this registration even for? I bet almost none of them could tell you or be ready to answer the question because there really is no point to a registration. Proof of insurance makes sense to me, but cops don't ask for that when they pull you over. If I'm blindsided on the passenger's side by some 1975 giant Tijuana hoopty, I want that covered. 
I don't want to picture my bank account being drained as the TJ piece of shit peels out trying to get away from me in hit and run situation. They don't ask that proof of insurance. Just registration, sir. I don't care if you're insured. They don't know why they're asking for what they're asking for. The real reason is your registration shows you have a permission slip from the big government to drive the car. You need permission from big government. Of course, that's what it's all about. But isn't your driver's license permission enough? Registration really has nothing to do with ownership. I could prove that in other ways. It's all a bullshit process. The first grade truther will only see its schemes to collect money. It's just about money. Oh, that's all it ever is. The first grade truther can't see past that. It doesn't need money, the not milk, at the highest levels. It never needs money. It's interested in elements of control. In the state of Pennsylvania, they used to mail you a little sticker you had to place on your license plate to prove you had up-to-date registration and everything was current, like that matters. A personal story. About 20 years ago, my sticker didn't have the right stickiness, didn't have that enough shit on the back, and I saw it was about to fall off. It was like peeling. So I took it off and I placed it inside my car. You needed to drive it. Very important. Well, what happened? Of course, just a few days later, I was pulled over because I didn't have this sticker on my license plate. Officer walks up, license and registration. I see you didn't have your sticker up to date. I said, wait, officer, wait, don't give me a ticket. I have it right here. I want you to feel it. It ain't got no sticky stuff. It was coming off. I did the right thing. I love the state. Feel it. No, he's like, I don't want to feel it. It ain't got no sticky stuff. What am I supposed to do? I didn't know if I could glue it on myself. Does the government legally allow me to take matters into my own hands and apply my own glue? I didn't want to get in trouble. Perhaps I could just tape it to my forehead so officers could see it as they drive to and from work. He'd say, if it's not on the license plate, look on the forehead. Make sure he's not having it stuck to his forehead. Then we won't have to pull him over. I don't know what happened. I forget what happened. I don't remember getting a ticket. I think he let me go. So, well, you just get that on there. Yeah, you're allowed to use Gorilla Glue. Don't let this happen again. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Of course, documenting the endless compliance burdens on people could become a book in and of itself. What to notice is, once again, the same. It's artificial for a pendulum to only swing in one direction. Nothing ever gets better, just worse. We know this type of announcement will never come from government in our lives. All this shit you used to have to do over here, you good people, for 10 years you had to do all this stuff. Good news. We're doing away with all of it. Enjoy your extra free time, you Winstons from 1984 schmucks. I'd accept that insult on the back end if they would actually improve something once a decade. I've probably told this story a few times over the years, so I'll be brief. I built a deck with my buddy, and my buddy's much more of a carpenter than I am. I was mostly cutting boards and holding wood. But the inspectors, you know, it's got to have everything inspected, a hole inspection for the 4 by 4 footers of the deck. The wood goes in the hole, and you pour concrete around the wood, the basis of the deck. What, you you can't proceed until you they come out and check your hole. Check which hole? You ain't going to check my hole. Get personal with me, boy. Not, not your holes. The holes in the green. They have to measure your holes. Th- not, not that. 36 inches. Fr- what? I can't proceed until you get your inspector out here to come put a damn tape measure in the holes? And he's like... This is uh, 34 inches. It needs to be 36. Just, just I'll let you go on this, but you tell me, you promise me you're going to dig out two more inches. He comes and puts the damn thing down the holes, and two holes were 30. First of all, frost line, that would be good enough in Moscow for frost line. It doesn't freeze down three feet. What do you think this is? Lower St. Petersburg? It's ridiculous. And if it does freeze and gets all twisted, it's, it's on me. I need no government looking out for me. So this is a long time ago, but I remember I'm talking to them. I'm going, wait, wait, wait a second. You telling me I can't proceed until you put a tape measure. Somebody comes out here and puts a tape measure in a hole. I got it. Well, when's that going to be? Well, next available date would be like next Thursday. What? Come on, man. And by the way, you better cover those holes. You better put your yellow tape around. If anybody were to step on it, that's your ass. That's your liability. They'll sue your ass. What a horrible, screwed up, not milk society. It's a not milk life for us. It's a, instead of kisses, we get kicked by these damn inspectors. Sorry. Of course, government is just one of 1,000 examples and ways the not milk distracts real people from engaging in their spiritual journey. In terms of the Chinese plastic junk 
that comes in the way of products that last about a week before they break, it has 10 million ways to distract people. My latest example is outdoor temperature gauges. I like to know what temperature is outside, kind of like at all times. It's like a little weird thing with me. I want several temperature gauges that tell me the outside air temperature. We all have our little quirks, okay? Matt, you are weird. It's weird, okay? When I moved in here, I've been here 22 years, I believe, there was this old Springfield plastic temperature dial gauge with a needle that points to 60 degrees or 70 degrees. It was outside the sliding glass door. Now, you know what I'm going to say. The old temperature gauge, which I estimate could be upwards of 30 years old, of course, it still works pretty much perfectly today, and it's in the rain all the time. The old shit worked. The new shit, Chinese, Foxconn, cheap junk. I wanted one for my bedroom bathroom. Yeah, so I could look at the temperature as I look outside. Yeah, it's weird. Let's just get over it. Okay, so I went to True Value Hardware Store. Okay, it should be really be called True Shen Yen Plastic Chinese Junk. I took a decent amount of time to install it. I had to get a little ladder, go up about eight feet. And, you know, it's it was not um, five minutes, put it that, with these little tiny screws, and I had to make a little piece. Okay, so I get this thing was, you know, I should have known better than, but they're all like 8 to $12. They're all this plastic crap. You If you choose to spend $20, you can't even get a good one. It's it, it, Lowe's, Home Depot, True Value, hardware stores like that. So I install the thing, mount it, whatever, and then, of course, it's not two degrees too low. It's consistently eight to nine degrees too cold. It just, from, so it's, it's 40 degrees, it shows 32. Okay, fine, I can add eight. I can just, if, if it was consistent, fine, I'll live with it. You know, okay, it says 32, I'll add eight, it's 40. That, fine, but it wasn't, it couldn't even stay consistent because as soon as it got real cold, the damn needles started to freeze whenever there was even a little moisture in the air and when it was real cold, below 32, 25 degrees, the needle would freeze at about 30 and it could be about 18 degrees outside because of the moisture. So it's like, well, it's an outdoor temperature gauge. Didn't they account that there could be something called rain? <laughs> anyway, it's just, why do they even put these things out if half of them are going to break or, or not perform? So after a year of like looking at this thing, eight to 15 degrees off or whatever, I'm tired of it. Okay. So I go to, I'm at Lowe's. And they have this shit ass brand called Accurite. I think it's called. And I'm looking through this whole row, and again, I like the kind with the little arm, like a clock and the dial, the kind with the, with the red mercury stuff or whatever, the red that goes up and down, and that's always very pretty accurate, okay, that, that little, it's the needle with the arms that aren't in that, and you get, okay, I shouldn't like that brand, uh, why I'm insistent on that brand, it doesn't matter. So I'm going through them, and they're all four to five degrees off. This one shows 72 degrees inside lows. This one shows 68 degrees inside. So I could kind of estimate, because there were so many different types of temperature gauges, what the temperature was. I found one. Okay, this one looks like it's pretty accurate, right? Because I can, I can gauge it off all the other different types. I take it home, and I put it next to the one that I know that works for like a week, and it seems to be very close to the one that I know it works. Okay, so I do the same thing. I get the ladder out. I go, I go out here, uninstall the old one, install this one. Because of the way this one was with these little screws, I dropped the screws in the dirt a few. It took about a half hour. It was a pain in the neck. I had to build another little piece of wood to bring it out where I couldn't see it from the window. Anyway, as soon as I installed that motherfucker, it was eight, <laughs> I'm not joking, it was eight to 10 degrees too high. So it's, it's been in the 50s around here during the day. It's, it showed 70 some degrees. Now, I, it is a little too close to the window, but my house is at 62, 63 degrees. The house isn't throwing this tremendous heat. Okay, I'll, let me wrap this up. I'm trying one more time. I found the spring field brand. Of course, it's just going to be the same Chinese Foxconn factory. It's coming from Amazon, nine or ten dollars. If this one doesn't work, I'm I'm done. I'm, it'll, it's going to damage me. I'm done with a little needle readout, and I'll go back to the one with the little red thing that goes up and down because I got to get my temperature right. Okay, but just, it's just okay, Matt. You didn't have to put yourself through that sort of distraction. No, but you see what I mean. Let's get back to the main points I'm making here in this chapter. I've been off the book for quite some time. I've talked about Real Boy Pinocchio versus the Wooden Pinocchio over the years as a way of making a general spiritual point. The cartoon movie shows Pinocchio's evolution from a possessed wooden puppet into a real boy of flesh. 
As usual, real people can pull a spiritual message from the story related to what we're supposed to do with our lives. Not that real people like us were ever spiritually would to start with. I don't think the core essence of soul or spirit was meant to evolve into anything new while we're here on this thing called earth. The way, say, like a, quote, new age person may claim that certain people, if they do the right things, are going to transcend in some way, fly up into the air, whatever they believe. You know I don't buy that. You know my thoughts, that this place was meant to be a low experience of smelly armpits, bad backs, just enough heaven mixed in to remind us of a few things, or potentially who we are or where we came from. This place is not for spiritual transformation as it's happening. It's part of an overall process, but not as it's happening, like um, Neo becoming the one or a realization. All of a sudden, you wake up as a different individual rising up into the air or the new age transformation. Not as it's happening is the key. A new being is not supposed to emerge from the chrysalis or the pupa from age between age 40 and 41 here. No, the entire life is a low experience. We're constantly reminded of that. But In a way, it seems like that's what the creeps are trying to do, maybe for themselves. They're a different thing than we are. They're a different entity. They're in love with this concept of alchemy, aren't they? Just in love with it. It's everywhere from their perspective, and not led into gold, whatever alchemy means to them, that sort of transformation. Led into gold is a bullshit cover story. Now, I'm not here to alch... I'm not here to alchemically change myself, as this life is happening. Although art and media messages could be interpreted to imply that if somebody does the opposite, takes up residence under the dragon's wing, it's not trying to improve themselves, but tries to cozy up closer to Tom Hanks's son, there could be some sort of a risk associated with that sort of decision. If not, what was the stay gold pony boy warning all about? Ah, think think about it. Was Ponyboy in danger of reverse Pinocchioing himself? Stay gold, Ponyboy, led into gold, stay, think about it. And then, is that the alchemy of the outsider's Dallas Winston? Uh, Winston, the, na- the same name, Dally Winston, the same name from 1984, Stay Gold, Ponyboy. No, I'm just, this is all horseshit, guys. I-, I don't believe these connections really exist. A lot of weird-ass connections do in this reality, but I've taken this too far just for fun. One of the most interesting things to talk about from my perspective is how it's now very likely that not all people here in this place called Earth are the same spiritual entity. It's fascinating to me. It explains so much when you observe, say, things like Melvin and Bezo. It seems that here on Earth, some entities may actually be related back to the Pinocchio example, like wood, spiritually speaking. This could be, say, the NPC. Maybe most of the creeps, or all the creeps, or both of them, or neither. We don't know, but they're not the same as us, and that's, in the end, all we really need to know. There are two ways we can use the story of Pinocchio to learn a lesson. We are born, and then immediately indoctrinated into Earth systems until we're about age 30 to 35, where at least at that point we would have a chance to break out, as we're doing. Most people, you know, are so ingrained in it, they have no chance. But, you know, you have no chance when you're going through grade school or high school, for example. So in a way, the asshole dark tries to whittle all of us into spiritual wood, like the reverse Pinocchio process. Then we need to do certain things or do a certain amount of work in part two to become like real again, or in a way to break free of its Jacob Marley chains, even if the no consequences people are right and our spiritual nature at its core cannot be corrupted. The story of Pinocchio is probably like 1,000 other things in this reality that reveals truth in an indirect fashion. This place is never going to tell you the truth directly, and when it does, the truth is always mixed in with deception, like baking brownies with both chocolate morsels and small pieces of shit at the same time. For example, The movie Pinocchio shows the audience that becoming flesh is the greatest thing of all time. The pinnacle of the movie. Isn't it wonderful? He's now flesh. It's the pinnacle of all achievement. Ego and flesh. That's beaten into every four-year-old. What chance do we have with with this sort of brainwashing from the start? In the movie, 
Flesh is the highest aspiration. How sick is that when it's actually the other way around? Flesh is fiddle and bends low. We're reminded that every morning when we get out of bed and go into the bathroom. Spiritual and what we could do for that aspect of the Vitruvian man's arm is the highest thing to strive for. The audience stuffs their popcorn in their mouth and sees that Pinocchio is so lucky at the end to have turned from wood into flesh. Now he can get real hemorrhoids and stop giving his Barbie doll girlfriend splinters. It's the same theme with the Star Trek The Next Generation character, Data, who for some reason endlessly aspires to be human more than anything else, no longer an android or a cyborg or whatever he is. But Data ain't nothing more than an android Pinocchio. All these beings, even Q, like a godlike, omnipotent being, Q talks to him and says, why do you want to be human? Trust me, you don't want to go there, man. Just enjoy what you are. Look, I'll admit this life is pretty interesting. It's a pretty amazing experience if you can see it in the right light. The emotions themselves, uh, you get a sense they can't be experienced uh, in the same way we're experiencing here. The listening of music, that sort of thing. Okay, But flesh... I don't think that should be anybody's highest priority, Data, Pinocchio, or anybody else. That's their ultimate goal. These are misguided characters. I mean, set your sights a bit higher, dude. A man may become an artist. And if that is so, should his aspiration for his final work be more than a piece of fruit duct taped to the wall? That's one of the biggest tricks of this place, fooling billions that what happens here on Earth while in the body is the pinnacle of all that's important in all of existence. This place is expert at placing all focus on the elements that are attached to this place. Ego, the part of the brain that, that thinks in the spellcraft of English, body, etc. It shows you in art, all these things are aspiring to be as great as you, which means that people just celebrate, oh, I'm a human and Data wants to be like me, instead of that human trying to aspire to give the spiritual part of them something that it wants from the experience other than ego, frontal lobes that thinks in the spellcraft of English, and body. The Knotnilk never wants you seeing this life as just a small train stop to benefit the whole of you or another aspect of you. But that's okay to be fooled. For many decades. This life doesn't work at all if we're not fooled for many decades and we don't take it seriously, at least for a little while. Some see the story of Pinocchio another way, that in this high stakes game, we are real now and this world and the not milk wants us to choose to turn ourselves into spiritual wood. This is called potentially a reverse Pinocchio. In this case, going from a real person into spiritual wood may be like wasting your life chasing the screen's temptations to ultimately end up like Tom Hanks, or even worse, his son Chet. The asshole, we'll talk about him in a moment, the asshole dark here wants to turn real boy Pinocchios like you and me back the other way into spiritual wood, perhaps. That doesn't necessarily mean giving away soul tokens, no consequences, people. It may mean interrupting the path and the journey, so your particular incarnation becomes a failure to the part that is not here. Quick note, have you, have you ever come across these videos? Tom Hanks' son, he's got a few, but this guy Chet Hanks with his tattoos all over the place. You want to talk about the best proof we have that these entities are not the same as you and me. And so Tom Hanks is going to see the movie Weird Science. And he's like, that's a good name for my son. He's manifesting. He knew his son would be some sort of demon creature like Chet, Chet from Weird Science. Remember, you stood but why? Tom Hanks, they told him that the baby would be some sort of um, Rosemary's baby. So he said, well, let's just name it Chet because it'd be a similar type of asshole from the character in the movie. How many famous people and celebrities were once maybe like you and me as real boy Pinocchio, but took up allegiance with it and moved in under its dragon's wing? There are so many, quote, deal with the devil stories that it must be a stuffed Lenin and carry to some degree real meaning. There must be truth of some kind in that trope, whatever that word means, even if you don't believe in a literal devil or Satan. Think about Hollywood celebrities or rock singers. Nobody ever gets out of line, ever. Nobody ever opposes the official narrative or what they're told. If somebody like Kanye West seems to do that from time to time, that's simply his puppet role. Maybe he's allowed to get out of control, and he thinks he's doing it all on his own, but of course, it's all supervised. He would never be able to say anything the Notnilk doesn't want. 
It's incredible to me how some in our community believe that Ricky Gervais was actually speaking out. No, those stars are not capable of legitimate objection or pushback on authority. I'm talking about the big stars, not certain individuals that had a very minor stardom that you know are part of our community. No, I'm t- the big stars never get out of line. They crossed over a line and became too far under the dragon's wing. There are no exceptions to this that I can think of. Some would say, oh, was Prince really talking about tales of chemicals legitimately on that talk show? No, I, I doubt it. Highly doubt it. 99% to 1% perhaps. But who cares? How almost none of the big ones ever get out of line means there is sort of a price for taking up residence under the dragon's wing. Or that entity isn't the same as you and I are and will always serve it or whatever the reason is. All we need to do is see the difference between them and us. I recently saw clips on ESPN showing Taylor Swift up there in her little box at the stadium watching her boyfriend. Is it yet? Yeah, Travis Kelsey is the tight end on the Chiefs. Jason Kelsey is the center on the Philadelphia Eagles. Taylor Swift is up there doing the, this little uh, tick top tock type dance or celebration when they scored a touchdown with was it Mahomes's girlfriend or Mahomes's wife and it's all it's a it was such a presentation to the press it's it's not legitimate to me their whole relationship doesn't seem in any way legitimate but it's it's not milk it's more than just Matt it's just publicity they each want the PR and I don't buy it there's something weird not milk going on with Taylor Swift and Jason Kelsey at the glass doing their little TikTok dances, celebration in the end. It's illegitimate. I don't believe it for a second. If anything were real, she might want to come see her boyfriend at the game, sit quietly with sunglasses behind the dark glass. I mean, not go up to the glass so all the cameras can focus on her. I mean, who and the people around us believe this is all legitimate. We're just one of those people. It's so frustrating. Give me a break. Taylor Swift, just go crawl back into a hole or something. But every one of our friends and family, for the most part, believe in the Not Milk's presentations. And they take its instruction manual and guidebook, and they read it very thoroughly and follow along like good little Winstons. They bow down to its systems and authority. Are they becoming the same sort of minion as, say, Tom Hanks' son Chet? If so, that would really be unfortunate. I don't think so. I think that's a different entity, but we'll talk about that some other time. The people around us who are defenders of reality in the Palace Guard, in a way do qualify as minions, but they're never going to be the same as we talked about Chet Hanks, but almost as bad or maybe worse. Have you ever come across Patrick Mahomes' brother, the quarterback for the Chiefs' brother? That's some sort of demon creature too, just like Chet Hanks. I mean, as far as our family and friends fall, I don't think, fortunately for them, they'll ever become that sort of not nilk entity. But to some degree, your brother or your uncle, your cousin, if they're the palace guard, in my opinion, under that definition, they are a minion for the not milk. Many real people have taken the bait, most. It doesn't mean your uncle is an NPC or the same kind of entity that Lady Gaga is or Chet Hanks. Most people around us take the role of the palace guard, defending every idea the system puts forth. The very worst example of this in the last 10 years, without a doubt, are the Karens, you know, the Karens fighting for more C, the V, imprisonment, fighting for the triple face masks. Is there anything worse than that Karen classification or population that emerged in 2020? In The Lord of the Rings, the presentation of Schmeagol or Gollum is very similar to real boy Pinocchio turning into wood. In the movie Lord of the Rings, Gollum was once a normal hobbit in the Shire. Look what the precious ring turned him into. The precious, of course, is a metaphor for society's false rewards and what chasing its yellow breadcrumbs does to something that was potentially once pure or real. For those of us who believe that the Lord of the Rings is a literal truth drop, the Gollum creature shows that one can be fundamentally transformed by spending a life coveting the precious. (laughs) My, My precious! You can be fundamentally transformed, potentially, by coveting the precious of this Middle Earth. The no consequences people don't believe that. Even Middle Earth in The Lord of the Rings appears to be some sort of truth drop. This could be, is middle, like Middle Earth between the dream state and what lies after death. To the first grade truther, it appears as if the creeps have hijacked the entire reality. As discussed, in my opinion, this is not the case. One thing that supports this is there appears to be a variety of rules here even the creeps can't break. 
The game board of reality is set up to give real people spiritual clues, and they're all over this place. There are certain hints, themes, and concepts that this reality seems to be forced to carry through time to help us, which the creeps seem like they can do nothing about. I call these things Humpty Dumpties, or more appropriately, stuffed Lenins. The story of Humpty Dumpty is, in fact, a stuffed Lenin. If you go to Google and do an image search of Humpty Dumpty, there are pages and pages of drawings and watercolors and cartoons created over hundreds of years. Across all of culture, there are tens of thousands of references to Humpty Dumpty, like a brief cameo in the movie Shrek, for example. There's a reason why almost everybody in the world has heard of Humpty Dumpty. If you stop to think about it for a minute, that makes no sense, because the little rhyme is quite lame. To me, the worldwide celebrity of Humpty Dumpty is impossible, unless the fable has deep meaning that comes with an important life clue of some kind that has to be carried through time for some reason. Stuffed Lenins with positive meanings that can help real souls figure certain things out seem to be carried through time, for lack of better understanding it better, carried through time by reality itself. I name the phenomenon a stuffed you-know-what because these things that help real souls and spirits, these fables, books, embedded meanings, embedded meanings in uh, music, stories, nursery rhymes, etc. They artificially move through time like, uh, pause, an embalmed communist leader under glass, never changing and always in some way being preserved by reality itself. The creeps may not like it, but per the rules here, the clues seem to have to be shown to real people, those that are ready to find them or see them. This nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty, thousands of others have been intentionally and artificially carried through the ages. If we're given these little clues all over the place, I don't see how this earth system is hijacked. Hijack! I don't see how that's possible. Or they would have uh, stopped pushing Humpty Dumpty. They wouldn't have allowed it in as a reference in Shrek. All these things would be um, not propagated. They would have been destroyed centuries ago if the reality is just by creeps. Hi, Jack! I don't buy it. This is a strange reality with many things here that can't be figured out. So stop trying. Take the spiritual messages and use them. You may have a different interpretation of Humpty Dumpty, but mine is very simple. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put that cracked head back together again. It means to me, never look to society. Never look out there to find spiritual answers. Never look out there to have anything put back together again. Look inside yourself. That can put you back together. In a way, we as spirits come to earth to, in a way... Don't love this term, in a way to put ourselves back together. You know, we've heard some weird stuff with shadow work, and I don't buy into that. But okay, it's just a way of saying something. We, in a way, are Humpty Dumpty in this presentation, no doubt about it. And in a way, we've fallen off the wall. If you want to relate that to a fallen Lucifer, go ahead. I care not to try to make that link. The story of Lucifer does not concern me and has nothing to do with my personal worry about myself journey in this tiny lifetime. If the creeps are in love with that story, well, who cares? Let them have it. If you look outward to seek help to be put back together, it ain't going to work out for your broken, humpty ass. That's what it's telling us. In the nursery rhyme, that dumbass egg even looked to the king's horses to put him back together. What? No horse I ever knew ever won Hasbro's operation game with a steady hoof. Horses are used to make glue with their hooves. They don't actually glue things back together. So I don't know what that egg was thinking. Of course, the king's men can't help Humpty either. In this case, the king's men represent modern political figures or presidents or prime ministers or emperors or dukes or kings, losers of authority in that regard, like Bibi, Melvin, Barack, and his betrothed Michael. Humpty Dumpty is a spiritual message of the highest order. It's very simple. On earth here, you must put yourself back together. There are no answers out there. This is very similar to the lure of the false grail quest. The rules of this reality also dictate the truth must be kept hidden or layered in some way inside art, only to be interpreted by old souls, souls, old souls, or those that are ready to, quote, wake up and graduate. 
Of course, whatever we interpret from a song or a nursery rhyme will only speak to us. If you try to tell your best friend about these messages, good luck. To him or her, it will simply be more evidence that you need to be committed to a white room. The clues are all over the place for real spirits to find or if one is ready to see them. Other than that, like we talked about, the opening scenes of what played out after the Tower of Babel. If a nursery rhyme like Humpty Dumpty simply told the truth outright and plainly, it would, first of all, wouldn't be believed, but then it wouldn't be allowed to exist, potentially, per the rules of this game. Only truth embedded in some way, or hidden, or layered in some form of art, or media, or song, or movie, or nursery rhyme, only in that sense can it be allowed to pass through time, in my opinion, as a stuffed Lenin to those who are ready to receive it. It's truth put out there for some of us to see that will be ignored by almost everyone else. To me, this is impossible. The concept of the Humpty Dumpty is impossible in a hijacked and trapped world. By the way, if you sing it, hijacked and trapped, make sure you put on the end or do your affirmation. We are not hijacked and trapped. We are not hijacked. Make sure you do that at least a few times. I can hear some troll now. Matt's telling everybody to sing hijacked and trapped. That's affirming that people are, their subconscious are believing they're hijacked. Not if you do the affirmation once. I don't believe in any way I'm hijacked and trapped. Therefore, I have the power to sing it all day long. It doesn't mean shit. It can't affect me if I do the affirmation. Why? Because I said so. That's the nature of reality that plays a trick. The person that that's the trick is being played on has the power to overcome it and see right through it and nullify it. I mean, this is, we've been over this many, many times, but it's one of the most important realizations in all of existence, so it will be repeated. The other day, I showed you the winter hat that Thaddeus and Heidi sent me. Of course, your first grader and third grade, oh, that's a symbol. I know that symbolism. That is some partial Catholic symbolism. Uh, I don't give a shit what symbolism is on the hat. First of all, I trust Heidius and, and Heidius. Thaddeus. <laughs> hey, you just, I just combined you guys. I just, I, I trust Thaddeus and Heidi. But it doesn't matter. Symbols don't work on powerful beings. See how this works? I don't give a shit. Somebody could send me a, a real nice hat. It could say Satan, number one. If it was a nice hat, I'd wear it for warmth. It could be a, you know what, can I say swas swastika? Can I say, it could be anything. If, it, if I like the hat, I'd wear it. We're more powerful than little symbols are backed by creeps. Who gives a shit? What the sim? Oh, my almost said the symbology was symbolism. I'm falling into that, Matt. You're taking the download too, like the rest of the truth community. It's not symbology is. It's I don't care what the symbolism is. You run in, if you run away from symbols or whatever, you're a low being, dude. Step into your power. I don't give a shit what the symbols are. I nullify all of them. Why? Because I said so. Of course, most people that we know around us work hard to do the opposite of what they should be doing in life. How do we know it's not what they should be doing in life? Simple, because they're doing what the not nilk wants them to do, which we know and can observe as part of its trick. Its trick is obvious at this point. It's almost like our friends and family are trying to endlessly make contract with it, to continuously move closer to the dark reality, to get its rewards or whatever it's precious that it offers. People like our friends and family not only fall for every aspect of the trick, they embrace what should be obviously seen through. But I, I give them a break in many regards. For example, the straw man. Do I expect my friend Tony to come out of the DMV driver's center, look at his new license, have his first name, all caps, last name, all caps, and be like, something doesn't quite feel right. There could be something sinister in how it wants me to operate through this fictitious name. I don't expect the people around us to see that. That's some high level shit. But even the lowest things they don't see through and they think you're crazy. Um, wh why is, I mean, it gets right back to, it's just right in your face. Why is there a gigantic penis obelisk phallus um, honoring supposedly George Washington inside the obvious re representation of vagina? It's right there for everyone to see. And when we, even when we point it out, they don't buy it. So it's one thing to fall for the straw man. The other thing to say it's completely normal for a giant penis, which is a representation of what the thing represents in history, to be an honor for our first president. They can't see through that. The people around us make contract with it across their entire trinity every day of mind, body, and spirit. And it will continuously look for more and more ways to pile on with more chains. It's the Terminator. It never stops to rest. It gives itself away. 
the, what, give me here's an example. If there is a surgery or a simple treatment that can save someone's life, of course, it makes sense to pursue it. I'm not saying not to. However, what do people do? All these commercials on television for all these different drugs. Go, they go through years of torturous chemo, rooting to this world, in my opinion, if they're in a certain situation or a certain age. It's announcing, you go through five years of chemo, remission, five years. It's announcing to this world, I'll do anything to not give this place up. Does that behavior help strengthen or add to the Jacob Marley chains with additional links? It may. Of course, my attitude on this topic shifts, of course, depending on one's personal responsibilities and situation. For example, if somebody's only 38 to 40 years old with young children to provide for and they're diagnosed with a cancer in three years, they have a chance of, of staying alive five to 10 more years to see their children through graduation, of course they should do it. I'm not saying that. That changes things. Either way, you know what I'm saying. And this place wants all of us looking back and constantly rooting to it. Its behavior in this regard is now obvious. So remember the stuffed Lenin of don't look back, as we discussed extensively in chapter 26. There's a common theme in stories and movies where the main character or protagonist has been so beaten up and abused for so long that they get to the point where they don't give a shit anymore and they face their fear head on. In these movie scenarios, they fight back because they have nothing left to lose. At their low point, they face their fear and overcome it. The most important part of this is the first step to winning is they let go of all fear, and they use this strength to take action. I'm talking about spiritual action in this regard and empowerment, not fighting back with punches. The latter, of course, is what must be shown in a movie to an audience, or nobody would go. It's a movie. Okay, so it can't be, again, there is no direct truth. It has to be our interpretation. This is a truth drop, though, when we see it in a work of art. It's the end of the movie Jumanji, for example, that we've talked about in the past. Robin Williams is being hunted by a man whose character in the movie represents his father in real life. Toward the end, he's tired of the endless running and the endless near death, uh, almost being killed, almost being, he just turns around to face the rifle head on. He's so beaten down, he has no more fear. He's had enough. He's a bit angry. In that way, anger can be helpful as long as it can be controlled. He doesn't give a shit any longer. In the movie, he's stuck inside some creepy magic board game called Jumanji. The dice has dropped. They show it in the movie rolling. The butt of the rifle is still pointed at him, but he doesn't get Jumanji and win until he has overcome his own fear. We can see, or at least our interpretation of the movie, the popcorn crunchers wouldn't get this, but we can see that that role would only be a winning role when he's reached a certain mental state. Only then does the dice stop rolling, gives him the role he wants, and he has won the game, able to exit this trap of Jumanji. His state of mind dictated that the hunter could not pull the trigger, and it got him the roll of the dice that he needed to win. He would not have been able to call Jumanji in the game of life and win if he did not perform this act of one overcoming fear, in a way defiance, and everything else that he did. So yes, oh Matt, you just said he's trapped in the game. Is he really trapped in the game if he's completely within his own power to beat the game and overcome the game and winning is completely up to him? Is he really trapped then if it's up to him? I don't think so, first grade truthers. Of course, the popcorn crunchers in the audience watching Jumanji would never see what we're seeing here or link these things together and would think that I'm nuts if they overheard me giving this presentation. It's happened to many of you. I know you email me. Some people have said, Matt, I have to listen to you in secret, like I'm going off to masturbate somewhere or something. If, I, if my wife walks in or my husband walks in on me listening to you, it's worse than me listening. They should give me shit when they hear me listening to Alex Jones or something 10 years ago. They go, oh, oh my God, you, you said you'd give that Matt up. He's, oh, he's affecting our relationship. I get blamed for everything, dude. I don't know. You know, I just it's like, you know, back in the day when we you, you go with your Playboy magazine you got good in high school not getting caught make sure when you listen to me you don't get caught think of how clever you were when you used to run off with your magazine bathroom boys 
sorry, <laughs> but I've gotten some emails about that. I, wa- I wanted to, to mention that I appreciate the people in that situation sticking with me. But back to the book, what we're talking about is in, say, a movie presentation, people being beaten down and being tired of being afraid. You know, be, be, living in fear is a terrible thing. Brooks Hadlin knew it. In the movie Predator, Billy, remember, Billy, Billy Bear, or whatever. That was Billy Bear. That's from, it's the same guy, I think, but that's from 48 Hours, but same actor. Billy in the movie Predator also demonstrates a similar attitude. In the jungle, with Schwarzenegger's movie Predator, they're getting picked off one by one. The predator is hiding in the trees. There's this level of stress that settles in over the entire team, level of fear and stress, even in these tough guys. They show constant anxiety from the anticipation of who's going to be taken out next. You know, how about this guy, how stressed out the littlest guy is. Billy! You know something. What is it? You ain't afraid of no man. What's out there ain't no man. That that guy's so stressed out. They're all stressed out. Well, Billy, he's the most cool of, of the bunch. But this presentation in a movie, it's an analogy of how most people in this society live their daily lives with a constant level of stress and worry and anxiety about the predators out there that the not milk has created, whether it be a late water bill or a creditor or somebody at work, this not milk creates the predator. I mean, I guess the situation in the movie was worse than us going into work, but maybe not by much. It takes the form, the predator out there in society takes the form of fear, stress, and worry generated by hundreds of things in our lives that are pushed forth by society itself ranging from government to the company you work for and everything else. So in Predator, Billy is sick of the anxiety of being hunted. He says, screw it. He turns around on that log thing, remember, to face the Predator head on. Sure, it doesn't go well for Billy. It wouldn't be much of a movie if it did, and Billy was able to kill the Predator, making the movie 30 minutes short, leaving Arnold with nothing to do at the end, but make for the chopper! (laughs) However, they all get tired of running. The motivation for this is they're tired of being afraid. As a metaphor, the predator could represent many things in our reality, as I mentioned. I ask you to notice that this is a repeating theme. It's a low point where one kind of, for a second, gives up, but then turns the tide, drops the fear, evolves, becomes a better person. Red in Shawshank says, stamp your form, Sonny, because quite frankly, I don't give a shit anymore. Matt, are you telling us not to give a shit? No, but this not give a shit moment or I'm sick and tired of it or a low point, it's presented this way in movies, maybe because it has to be that way in the movie. There is something we can benefit from having that state as long as we turn it immediately into the positive. No, I'm not saying just become a heroin addict and not give a shit any longer, not at all. But there's that brief moment where that can be used Uh, to overcome fear and to start a new path. The theme continues. The girl fighting Freddy Krueger in Nightmare on Elm Street eventually got pissed, got mad, and turned to face him. In most of these movies, unlike Billy, she wins. Billy lost, but he's not the star of the movie. Schwarzenegger was. The end of the movie Revolver, there's a scene with the bad guy played by Ray Liotta, where he's almost begging Jason Stratham, or whatever his name is, to fear me, fear me, as Jason walks right by, not fearing him at all. He has fear of him, perhaps the whole movie, and overcomes it. He kind of laughs, if I remember correctly, as he passes by Ray, who doesn't then know what to do. Ray, the entity that needs to be feared, doesn't know what to do when he's no longer feared, understanding he's now lost his power over Jason. To me, Ray Liotta in the movie Revolver represents, like literally, not milk reality. Ray started to become very agitated when Jason stopped giving him what he needed. Ray, Leota, or the entity he represented in the movie, needed to be feared. Of course, the movie writer and director would have no idea what I'm talking about, in my opinion. I mean, n- we may- maybe, right? Okay, there, obviously, um, Kubrick, they're certain that d- do understand uh, the, the creepy room and, and do, you know, we under- not, but I'm just saying, in most cases, the songwriter doesn't have any idea the spiritual message that we're taking away from it. And because the songwriter doesn't even know, that doesn't make what we're taking away from it incorrect. Not at all. In most cases, the minions don't know what they're doing. This is just how the reality works. 
A variation of this theme runs through hundreds of movies. How many horror movies end with the people who are running scared at some point turning around to face the evil? Rocky Three with Mr. T is the same theme. At freevoice.io, we looked at the big speech on the beach with Adrian, where Rocky finally admits the real problem is his fear. He finally yells out and tells the truth. I'm afraid. Uh, let me say, I'm afraid. He finally admits it. Then at that point, the pendulum can start swinging back the other direction. The only purpose of the rematch with Clubber Lang was to overcome and face his own fear. There were no other reasons to fight. Adrian makes that clear. Again, quote, a real fight has to be the way it's presented in the movie. It's a movie. But that's not our interpretation of what we can take for ourselves. You and I will never win by going off to actually fight it. It's a metaphor or analogy. For us, an actual fight is what the not milk wants. That's why its top minions are loathsome, hated creatures like Hillary. It works hard and overtime to be seen as a dark foe with all this talk of controllers and the aluminum Ducati motorcycle and all that it spreads and propagates throughout the truth research community. It's highly focused on our group and it implants so many creepy breadcrumbs to chase and drama and what did the movie Enemy at the Gates Pizza enemy at the gates and adreno and all, okay, all these. Okay, it's doing a lot of horrible, sick shit, but all that stuff was specifically implanted so we would run with it in a certain way. This is so obvious at this point. Okay, if the first grade truthers can't see it, I can't help you anymore. It doesn't want us fighting our own spiritual battle the right way, going off, doing it ourselves, worrying about ourselves, cutting chains, walking away from it. It wants us fighting a battle with it. This is obvious at this point. There are many more examples. The end of the movie Labyrinth is similar to Revolver, with Jennifer Conley telling the creepy Goblin King, and you know who that was, you have no power over me, David Bowie. And once he realizes she means it, he immediately loses his power. The end of the never-ending story is also similar in a sense. The dark reality is set up to beat what they call a real human being down into a low powerless state. But the meanings that are quietly embedded in art, books, poetry, and all different forms of art continuously remind us of how powerful we really are if we ever struggle with that. And it is up to us to turn the tide by realizing the power that we do have. Once again, here's the best news of all time. In all cases, the end result of what happens here is determined by the actions and state of mind of the real person who's in the ring by himself. There is no Clubber Lang. He's in the ring by himself. The bad guy was never in control and only appears to be in control by way of a trick. Upon this realization, it matters not what the monster in the ring does. Whether standing before you, whatever you called not milk, was once looking like a clubber lang, or the hunter from Jumanji, or the predator, there's nothing there in front of you other than what you make it out to be. It's a game where the opponent is false, and only what you create it to be, or give it its weapons and its power over you. Matt, that's delusions of grandeur. You're lucky to be living in the United States. You could be living in another country where Idi Amin could just throw you in jail. You're so powerful. They'll haul your ass out. See how powerful you are when they throw you in a, in a cell. Or even this government. Could, you have no power to fight it. I'm not talking about physical one-on-one. Or I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the reason you came into this existence. If you don't believe you came in here for a reason or purposely came in here to have an experience, if you don't believe you existed before this incarnation what are you doing at this channel i mean there are basic things that we share here in terms of our belief set I'm not talking about no i don't think if i lived under Idi Amin in uganda i would always be more power i'm not talking about physical i'm talking about something that's bigger than this place the doing it can't stop you from doing ultimately what you came in here to do. Whether Look at Andy Dufresne, whether you're in a cell or anywhere else. The physical is not important to me. Asteroids do not concern me, Admiral. That does not concern me, the physical. The spiritual is what I'm, tr- I'm here to do. 
But that side doesn't even exist to, to most people around us. Hey, so be it. Who cares anymore? Why is the end of Gone with the Wind perhaps the most famous ending in movie history? Is it really that great, that ending? Or does something else drive its 80-year immense popularity? Could this be a stuffed Lennon as well? I think so. Throughout the movie, Scarlet never changes her nature. She's never genuine, always playing both sides, always worried about materialism and stressing over a useless estate, land, called Tara. When she's at her low point, her vow is about never being poor again and linking herself to fiat currency. What? She reeks of a minion or a creep. There's no spiritual side, and its related qualities like compassion don't exist in Scarlet. Red is rich too, but you never see him care a bit about money. Maybe you'll consider this a stretch, but could Scarlet's endless games, disloyalty, and nonsense be a metaphor for not milk reality itself? Rhett finally reaches his breaking point at the end of the movie, and just like the other movie characters that we've looked at, he no longer gives a shit. He's finally ready to walk away and not look back. He has cut all ties and attachment to Scarlet, likely named that color red for good reason, like Will Scarlet perhaps related to the color of the lower chakra, but even, nevertheless, it's that color for a reason in her and Will and everyone else. After watching the last scene of Gone with the Wind, we know that Rhett will have no regrets, and he will never return or come back to her or her reality or whatever she represents. He's done. He won't miss his not milk scarlet. He won't look back. It's not exactly a Jumanji moment of dropping fear, but in a way it's similar. It's cutting attachments to other things that the Scarlet reality represents. In Robin Hood, again, the character of Will Scarlet was similar because it, it's cited in history as an evil cousin or it's, it's painted different ways if you look at different places about the lore and legend of Robin Hood, but something that's a little nasty, Will Scarlet. Either way, the name of Miss O'Hara is not by accident. The same thing happens to Red in the Shawshank Redemption in his third and final parole hearing. In the first two hearings, Red tries to memorize lines and say what he thinks the review board wants to hear. Nobody ever wins on earth by trying to please the not milk, unless you're one of its own minions. In his third parole hearing, Red is an old man, having recently lost Brooks to a hanging and Andy to his escape. He doesn't give a shit any longer. He's beaten down and ready to turn the corner. He has no more fear. He speaks his mind with a, quote, end of Jumanji, no fear mindset. Of course, carrying this aura, his patrol is instantly approved. There's massive truth in this scene, but it has to be interpreted in the right way. A young person listening to this or reading this should not aim to not give a shit and bitch out a school principal the next time he or she is called into the office saying, I don't care. No, that's not. That, no, there's a lesson to be learned here, but not to act out exactly. That will not work. That type of juvenile behavior stems from fear. Red's success did not just come from what he said in the parole hearing. It has very little to do with the words he used. It's the state of being, his aura, and his frequency that he's exuding behind the words. In this regard, you can't fool yourself or fake it to make it. It's transmuting rock bottom into something positive. No more fear must be real in you or in anyone else before taking certain action or not giving a shit. This means not playing its game any longer, not caring if there are social consequences for certain decisions. And we've lived the social consequences in that regard, haven't we? In that regard, it can't get much worse, but in also we don't really give a shit, do we? We wouldn't trade it, and we wouldn't go back into society. Almost nobody here is will ever be the cipher from the Matrix saying, I want to go back in, and I want to be rich, and I want to eat steak like this. No, we would not trade it. This means we're getting very close to the state of where we need to be. When Luke said to Yoda in The Empire Strikes Back, I'm not afraid. At that point in the second movie, it was bullshit. Luke at that point was not genuine. Yoda knew it, and look what happened. He lost. He went off and lost to Vader, got his hand cut off. 
Most of them escaped the Cloud City, but Han got frozen. C-3PO was blown into pieces. Luke had to fail before he really lost his fear, which he did in the next movie. Did not lose his fear in The Empire Strikes Back, only in Return of the Jedi. Yoda complained that Luke must not be tempted to go to the Cloud City to try to save his friends because his training was not yet complete. Yoda said, the cave, remember your failure. The, the cave, remember your failure in the cave. Eh, whatever. However, if we parallel this art to our life experience on Earth, Luke had to go off and fail and learn the lessons that come with failure before he could become a true Jedi. Again, Yoda complained that Luke must not leave his training in the swamp, but it seems likely Luke's real training could only be completed if he first failed. When Luke returned to Yoda, there was no more training necessary. Luke did it himself. Yoda died in that last scene when he came back. Enough you know. He, he didn't need any more. That proves he needed to go off and fail. That, are you relating this to potentially what this reality system on Earth is all about? I am. I don't, maybe I'm crazy. Yoda died in that last scene. However, we see in the next movie, Return of the Jedi, that Luke had become a true Jedi. His whole countenance, whatever that means, is completely different in the beginning of the movie. This shows that overcoming the failure was more important than simply finishing the training in the swamp. You have to go do it. Can't be told about spiritual things and wherever we came from. You have to go do it, or at least certain classes, you need the field trip. That's what this is, the field trip. The book learning doesn't work. That's why, in my opinion, this reality system was created. Yes, we can be traumatized. So what? That is part of what we're here to be. Can be very. There are people that are permanently and fully disabled, like our friends Josh. I don't know how to reconcile that. Are you saying Josh signed up for that? I don't know, but I don't think anything here is by accident, or we're just trapped, or that. I don't buy it. Okay, maybe Josh, whatever he's going through now, his benefit will be a thousandfold over what we get out of it. I don't know, but th this is my belief set. This life could be a parallel to Luke's failure. There's a reason they're out there to destroy Star Wars and the entire franchise by making all the new material into piss water, intentionally making the new Star Wars bad. I'm extremely confident that this no-fear attitude is essential to get to in life. Now, we don't have to be perfect. We get to 90 to 95%. The body will always have limitations. Okay, It's more of a permanent aura that we create than a false bravado that can be faked. It can't be faked. The atti So attitude isn't the right word, but you know what I mean. Red kind of bitched out the people in the parole board, but it doesn't mean we should act like that or like assholes who don't give a shit. The way we should act should be just the opposite. Luke in the third movie was a cool dude coming into Jabba's palace. It's a combination of one, having faced the fear, having removed it, two, not giving a shit about this reality's rewards. Okay, you can you can keep the not give a shit attitude and apply it to certain things. Not caring about the social consequences of not going along with what society says to do. Not coveting or going after its rewards. Not playing its game. It's positive to carry the no give a shit attitude in that regard, and most of us do it now. We've lost most of our friends. Our family thinks we're this and that, etc., the true spirit cannot lose, and this is not realized by most people who around us who don't even consider that side of the Vitruvian man even exists, and the people around us work hard to please this reality. I don't know any other way to say it. They try to get closer to it and to take, and they beg for its dog treats. The actions of, number one, uh, facing the fear, and number two, um, you know, not giving a shit about reality's rewards, these types of things uproot yourself from the world, cuts the Jacob Marley chains. Most people try to make additional contract with society. They're more like Scarlet and worry about what people will think and social status and thumbs up and bullshit like that. Most people around us are extremely afraid all the time and will do almost anything to hang on to this world. In that parole hearing Shawshank scene, Red was separating from his reality, or from reality in a sense, or at least rising above it. And the not-milk minions sensed his new aura. 
Minions of that level likely feared Red's aura and new frequency that they were uh, detecting that they didn't detect before. So they said collectively, let's get this real being the fuck out of here. His attitude spells doom for us if he stays inside our system. That's what those people knew, that the system of the jails, except they wanted him out, let him be someone else's problem. That's the way I interpret it. So in a way, become the essence of a being that the not milk most dislikes. Going off to fight it is what it most likes. Your inner knowing will tell you the clear answer of how to behave and act in every situation. If you organize 500 people to march on a government building, uh, do you think the not milk likes that or fears it? Of course, anybody here for more than six months knows that's exactly what the not milk wants. The first great truth or videos will play to your ego and how close you're getting to figuring things out and how scared it is that you're figuring things out. The not milk, the first great truth videos will tell you how terrified this system is that we're learning bullshit. It's given us most of what we've run with over the last 10 years. Well, how can that be, Matt? It's very simple because if you're spending your time trying to figure it out, you're not figuring yourself out. Only one part of that teeter-totter is what we're here to do for yourself, for ourselves. That's why it continuously tries to lure us back into the bog. It gives itself away. It wants, it will eventually have to reveal almost everything in terms of how it works. If you're so concerned with how it works, then we're not doing part two, the work, the self-work, the only reason we came into this existence. We had to be in the bog for a while because Ultimately, we turned it into knowledge that we started to apply to ourselves. I don't think I don't think we could ever get to part two if we didn't understand that there's something here trying to block us from that. At least that would not have been my journey. I can't speak for you. So at the end of Gone with the Wind, and Red says, frankly, my dear, you know, I don't I really and truly don't give a shit anymore. You know, if the reality itself in this metaphor analogy is scarlet then it does not want us ever being red. It does never, Red Butler does not want us, interesting, red and red, huh? It read from Shawshank, Red Butler. It does not want us going off on our own. And then what is what happens then? We take our energy and attention with us, permanently walking away from the reality scarlet. That's why the rabbits will always jump right back on your lap. The rabbits you were hunting that were running from you all these decades, they will jump right back on your lap when you are truly ready to put the rifle away or sell all the hunting equipment. Then it will beg to be hunted. The rabbits will beg to be hunted. Ray Liotta, the end of Revolver, fear me, please, fear me. It will beg because it, the last thing it wants is for you to take your energy and attention as Rhett Butler and walk out the door on it, Scarlet. That's why, in the end, Scarlet wanted Red very much. She wanted him back. Of course she did, because for the first time she sensed he was ready to walk out for good. Scarlet is this reality. Maybe. Thanks for listening.